Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Wall Street for Main Street podcast. My name is Mo, and today's guest is the returning guest, Mark Thornton. Mark Thornton is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. Mark, thank you for coming back. Hey, Mo. It's great to be back on your program. Things are really heating up out there in the financial world. Uh, yeah, and, and yet they're still building those tall skyscrapers that you frequently ride and talk about. Yes, they are. They're they're building skyscrapers everywhere I go. Uh, just in my recent travels to Asheville, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Toronto, Canada, I see these mega projects going up all over the place. And even here in little Auburn, Alabama, little sleepy college town, uh, there's been uh, two massive student apartment complexes that have been completed for this fall. And there's four new ones that are in the works where they're knocking down buildings, digging down deep into the ground uh, with plans for luxury student apartments right in the downtown area. Uh, so I think this is a, uh, a phenomenon that is hitting the American and world economy uh, all over the place with this uh, excessive um, construction. Now, I wonder if that's related to the college uh, bubble uh, in Auburn due to the continued construction of new building in that area. I'm sure it's related to that as well. Yes, it is. I mean, there's um, there's a lot of money uh, going into higher education, a lot of debt, a lot of student debt, and a lot of business investment, um, and they think they're going to be able to make long-term uh, profits on all of this, but that's where uh, the Austrian skepticism about these bubble economies during periods of ultra-low interest rate. And you know the interesting thing, Mo, about the local phenomenon, and it's really not local developers borrowing money from local banks. A lot of these projects have to do with uh, hedge funds and financial firms on a national or global scene who are setting up operations uh, getting the money directly from financial markets and coming in uh, to college towns like Auburn and, and building these uh, large uh, college complexes. And then also, if you uh, read the news lately, there's a million student march demanding for uh, free or affordable, I, I think they just want free college education, and you know that's one of the platform for the Democrat in the presidential election is that they want free universal college uh, education for all the uh, Americans that are, want to go to college. So I, I think that's going to create more malinvestment in the uh, college community in, in relation to uh, building construction and and the football program that gets billion and millions of dollars. So that it's no end in sight. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, the um, college and universities are a mess uh, right now. There's a declining population of people who are eligible to go to college, but colleges and universities have expanded uh, tremendously. And then you have the online uh, versions uh, swiping a lot of these students. And so all of this money that's being plowed into education um, is a very risky business, and the idea that we need free education, of course, free anything is a, is a bad idea, basically, um, for for college students. I mean, I can understand they're they're going into tremendous amount of debt, but there's a lot of college students who aren't getting jobs uh, when they do graduate into this economy. So, the idea of funneling more resources in that direction seems uh, completely irrational and counterproductive uh, from a market point of view. And yeah, and, and there's a lot of students that get in majors and, and, and studying in areas that's not, pretty, not practical in the real world, so that's hurting them in the job market as well. I mean, I, I paid my own way to college, and I, I, I definitely don't want these college students in the future, getting a free education when I only when I had to pay my own way. I mean, that's, that's really not fair. I do want affordable education for everybody that wants to go to college, um, and also alternative like online uh, courses for people that want to learn. But to give them free education, I, I don't think that's fair. Well, the one thing that nobody really understands, Mo, is that when the federal government provides 
subsidies in the form of grants, research grants, student loans, Pell grants, and all the rest, um, that doesn't really reduce the cost of going to college. That ends up increasing the cost of colleges because it's a subsidy uh, to colleges and higher education in general. And so that's really one of the prime drivers of the fact that the cost of higher education is rising two, three, four times the uh, standard government CPI uh, increase in prices. Uh, and the, the reason is, is is largely driven by these subsidies, uh, which basically end up bloating uh, college administrations um, and driving up the, the real tangible cost of production, uh, as all subsidies do. And yeah, and that's what subsidies do. They just increase costs uh, for goods and service for uh, the people on Main Street, unfortunately. Um, so for this podcast, I want to twist gears here and give our audience a little Austrian economic one-on-one one -on -one, and talk and compare Austrian economics to the uh, theories of John Maynard Keynes and what people call here mainstream economics or Canadian economics. And the first subject I want to talk about is deflation. Now, the mainstream or the Canadian economics, which composed the people on in the government, uh, central bank, uh, you see them on their financial news talking about why deflation is bad, we need inflation. I mean, if you look at the central bank all around the world, they all have inflation targets. None of them have deflation targets. They all want inflation. The Federal Reserve, they want 2% inflation. Uh, they think deflation is bad. If you just Google Bernanke and Yellen and, they, uh, and deflation, you, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about how it caused the de Great Depression and how it's bad for the economy because it decreased consumption, which is, I think is a myth. So let's talk about that. Why do you think they, uh, they think deflation is bad? Well, first of all, Keynesian economics and Austrian economics are entirely different approaches to understanding the economy uh, the Keynesian approach is very mechanical and accounting oriented, whereas the Austrian view of the economy, we like to think it's very realistic, that our ability, our ability to analyze it is quite limited, um, and that it's kind of a living, breathing system, um, much like a biological system. So when you get to the topic of deflation and you listen to Keynesian economists, which is basically the the economist in most of the financial press and the media and government economists and academic economists, they're dominated by this Keynesian slash mainstream view of the economy. And you're unlikely really to see Austrian analysis unless you're tuned into alternative media such as this podcast. So when you get to deflation, there's an entirely different view, and I'll try to give you uh, a simplified version of that. The Keynesians are afraid of deflation. They have a phobia about deflation. As a matter of fact, I've coined a term for the fear of deflation or deflation phobia and it's based on a Greek translation so it's kind of crazy but it's called apoplet horismos phobia and if you google deflation phobia you'll see it and I've got a paper in the quarterly journal of Austrian economics which explains all of this but essentially the Keynesian see deflation as leading the economy into a black hole so you'll end up in an economic depression uh, from which you'll never be able to get out. And, and so they even talk about it in terms of a black hole and the fear of getting close uh, to deflation or the event horizon, as it's known in physics. Um, they're deathly afraid of that. Um, they don't explain why they're afraid of it generally. Uh, the only tangible thing that they can offer is that in a deflationary environment uh, it makes the government debt harder to pay back um, you know it might drive down consumption people might delay their consumption on the basis of 
expectations of lower prices in the future, but this is all comes stems from the experience of the Great Depression when we had uh, deflation of prices and large-scale unemployment, and we had a very difficult time getting out of it. But if you looked around uh, through history in the United States and in other countries that experienced deflation, uh, generally speaking, those are not uh, those periods of price deflation are not associated with recessions or economic depressions. They're much more often associated with periods of economic growth. So even a mainstream uh, historical analysis finds that the Great Depression is an isolated incident. It's not common for price deflation to be associated with depression. It's more often economic growth. So their case really doesn't hold up materially in an in a, in a honest historical investigation. Now, the Austrians, on the other hand, generally view deflation as a benign thing or as a good thing or as a very important thing uh, in the economy. Um, it's a, a standard thing in a market economy where you have high rates of economic growth in a market economy and you have smaller increases in the money supply and as a result uh, of this growth rate being higher than the uh, increase in gold production prices tend to fall and in a market economy we can even see this in our uh, our economy where there are many prices such as flat screen TVs personal computers uh, things of that nature where the prices are falling um, on a regular basis, and people view that as a good thing. I mean, Austrian economists, Walmart shoppers, uh, house um, household directors, uh, you know, people who are spending the money for the household, uh, they all love lower prices. They are all searching for lower prices. And so the vast bulk of society, other than these Keynesian economists, love deflation. And so uh, deflation is a normal thing. It's a good thing for consumers. Their wages uh, go further. Their standard of living rises. And what about the important case of when an economy does collapse? Uh, so say you've, you've had a central bank expanding the money supply and keeping interest rates low, causing a boom, uh, and then eventually you get to the economic bust where things start to melt down and Keynesians start to fear deflation. Well, what is exactly happening in these periods? Well, uh, yes, there is deflation or disinflation, but where is that disinflation? That's where, you know, we don't, the, the Keynesians look at GDP, they look at the overall price uh, index. Austrians look more microeconomically, and what we find is that the price of capital goods in the economy, um, such as um, uh, retail, wholesale, warehouses, land, uh, skyscrapers, all of that uh, is falling rapidly in price. Uh, stock prices are falling rapidly. Um, when you look at, say, the market for labor with high rates of unemployment, wage rates or real wage rates will decline significantly. But when you look at the price of consumer goods, uh, toilet paper, toothpaste, apples, and so forth, those prices tend not to fall as much. And so if you're in an environment where capital, land, and so forth is falling dramatically, where labor prices uh, are falling significantly and, and various types of labor are available for uh, as unemployed, and cons yet consumer uh, products and services have not fallen, well, that's where the entrepreneur uh, sees a light bulb go off and says, I can combine that really cheap capital with that super abundant labor and produce toilet paper, toothpaste, apples, or whatever, and make a profit. And so in the Austrian view, it's not this cataclysmic black hole phenomenon. It's, it's really like a shock absorber. Because as those prices fall differentially, entrepreneurs find ways 
of putting those resources back together, producing for what the consumer wants, and making a profit. Now, one of the other myths about uh, deflation is that profit will fall for uh, small business and corporation if we do have uh, deflation, which is not true because if uh, we have deflation, then that means prices and wages would also fall, and that would offset any uh, loss in profit for the corporation and small businesses. So if we had deflation before deflation, some of the if a company was making uh, 50 cents from every dollar and we had deflation and free market, the prices and wages would fall and then they'd make uh, from every 50 cents, they'd make 25 cents, uh, which is still a 50% profit margin. So that's a simple example of, of uh, profit in relation to deflation. But that's one of the other myths that uh, all the mainstream economists talk about. And then also you mentioned that you know they are more or look at uh, the economy from an accounting point of view, and I agree with that because the Federal Reserve and central bank all over all over the world they use a spreadsheet and mathematical model to try to figure out how to improve the economy, and it doesn't work like that because the economy is so complex they cannot capture every uh, piece of the economy and try to make it better. So that's another thing that. Uh, the biggest problem I see with uh, uh, mainstream economics. Oh, that's absolutely right. And, you know, you're pointing to a very important phenomenon that occurs precisely at this point in time, this where the economy seems to be melting down, uh, going into a bust or a correction, as the Austrians call it, and this deflationary ph phenomenon takes place. Well, the deflation is, is very uneven, and, uh, and so you cannot anticipate – uh, projecting into that unevenness and that uncertainty that's going on in the economy. And you can't track all the existing firms and production processes because this is precisely the period where all new forms of goods and, and uh, companies uh, actually develop. There's a surge of development of new products and, and product models and corporate models that occur uh, during the recession or correction. And it's precisely because there's plenty of office space, there's plenty of warehouse space, there's plenty of factory space, there's plenty of unemployed engineers, software technicians, and so forth, so that entrepreneurs can spring into that environment and use those unused resources low-cost resources to build whole new product lines. And so when we look at the leading companies of today, um, IBM's PCs, uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, um, a lot of these uh, products and corporations formed and developed um, in these periods of deflation and recession and, of course, the Fed was not tracking them or knew nothing about them um, at the time. But they've become, of course, it's been noted in the news lately that a lot of these startups over the last 25 to 30 years are really the source of uh, job creation um, in our economy. These are the places that are creating breadwinner-type jobs where um, one person in the household uh, goes to work for one of these corporations at various levels within the corporation and is able to uh, support in a prosperous way uh, a family uh, unit. And, and so that's the thing that we need to keep our eyes on is there's opportunities um, through recession. We cleanse the system of misallocated resources and the market economy, if uh, it's free to do so, will bring about um, a, a new source of economic growth in the form of new companies and new products. Now, you mentioned that uh, the deflation did not uh, create the uh, Great Depression. Now, in general, can deflation cause a recession or a depression in the Austrian economic point of view? Not unless it's brought about um, by government policy. For example, there's been some 
uh, terrible things in places like Argentina, where the country froze everybody's bank account um, in effort to uh, to stop the devaluation of their currency. And of course, if you freeze people's bank accounts, uh, you're going to crash the economy. Uh, but other than those kind of mechanical deflations, um, deflation is not the cause of these recessions. It's actually the ultimate cure. It, it's the it's the thing that, first of all, uh, takes the misallocated resources and shows that they're unprofitable and have to be used in a different way. And also, it re- helps rearrange resources in new companies and new expansions so that we get out of the recession very quickly. And I think this is a very important historical lesson to learn is that the U.S. entered an economic depression very similar to the Great Depression in 1920. And in response to that depression, the federal government did nothing. Uh, They didn't expand spending. They didn't increase benefits. Uh, they actually cut the budget. President Harding was a was a so-called do-nothing president uh, who spent most of his time while he was alive uh, drinking and playing golf with his buddies. Uh, the Federal Reserve actually increased interest rates during this period. And what do you know? The economy recovered and was booming again in about nine months in 1920. Okay. Now, in contrast to that, in 1929, when the stock market collapsed and the economy started collapsing, Herbert Hoover uh, was very much an interventionist president, and he started all sorts of programs to keep prices up and to expand output and to maintain employment and wage rates in in the face of uh, deflating prices. And uh, and then, of course, FDR picked up where Hoover left off, and we had 10 years of Keynesian-style New Dealism uh, in the United States economy, and we never, as a result, never really recovered uh, from that because government was intervening so much that the market process was not allowed to take place and we didn't get that cleansing process, uh, and we didn't get a, an environment where entrepreneurs uh, felt unthreatened because they very much were threatened by both Herbert Hoover and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so 1920 was the right approach, the do-nothing approach. It worked fabulously. Uh, and then in 1929, with the New Dealism mindset, uh, it was a disaster. Yeah, the 1920 Depression is also known as the Forgotten Depression because you don't read about it in your history book and all the economists barely ever talk about it. Uh, It's just interesting how in 1920 they did nothing. They cut the budget. They let uh, deflation creep into the economy, cleaned out the system. And as you said, nine months later, they had a booming economy, which led to the Roaring Twenties. And then at the end of the 1920, they shifted and went another direction on how to uh, get the economy going. I'm just wondering why they just didn't copy and paste what they did in the 1920s instead of going through another, going through, going through another direction and not ultimately prolong the Depression. Well, um, Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce in the Harding administration, and he he developed all sorts of plans to deal with these problems in terms of, you know, putting tariffs on trade and uh, subsidizing labor and, you know, forcing businesses to maintain prices and wages and output levels and and to uh, provide subsidies for agriculture. So he had developed all of these policies in the um, in 1920, 1921, but Harding just ignored him and it infuriated Hoover, uh, who was an engineer by trade. He was a railroad engineer by trade. So he had this mechanical view of things that you could just put Band-Aids on everything and and hope that everything will turn out right. And so in 1929, 
when the stock market crisis hit, he already had in his own mind, he had already developed all these policies. And so he put them together and implemented them immediately. I mean, he was, he was very active um, against uh, this economic downturn in late 1929. Remember, the stock market crashed in October. And so he was immediately, um, you know, doing and implementing his activist policies. And I think one of the first things he did was called conferences of leading industrialists um, and encourage them to maintain employment, to maintain wages, and to ma- maintain output levels, um, which, of course, they did, and it ended up hurting those companies even more. And that's an interesting insight that you just gave on Hoover. I did not know he was uh, part of the Harding administration. And also uh, to note that the source of deflation uh, for the past century, for the most part, had been government and central banks. But for the source of inflation, had been constant as well. It's always been the central bank and government that always created inflation for the past century. And it's alive and well today where all the inflation in a country's across the world had come from central bank and government and had never come from free market forces. Yeah, I think that I first recognized that business about Herbert Hoover in Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, which I would urge everybody to get a copy of that. Um, It is a great myth buster uh, concerning the... uh, propaganda education that Americans are given in uh, in school and in college. Um, and as you mentioned uh, correctly, the Depression of 1920 to 21 is never even brought up. And I think that, isn't it correct, Mo, that, uh, that Jim Grant's new book um, on that depression, that, that's titled The Forgotten Depression, right? Uh, yeah, it is. So and that's that's another great book that your audience um, would very much benefit from. Uh, it's a great read. He's a great writer, um, and it's completely non-technical. It's more of what's really going on uh, in the real economy. So I think it's excellent in the sense that you know people don't want to necessarily read the way economists think. They want to read about how people actually are, and James Grant's book is uh, really wonderful in that respect. Yeah, it came out last year, and the, the title, as you mentioned, is The Forgotten Depression, 1921, The Crash That Cured Itself. So if people want to buy that book, I can go to Amazon and check it out. <laughs> so uh, anyway... Uh, Going back to our discussion, uh, another thing I want to talk about uh, in relation to uh, John Maynard Keynes is his general theory and the fallacies. Now, I want to talk about your top three flaws about the general theory. Um, so uh, let's talk about that and we'll, we'll uh, go from there. Well, Mo, I think you've stumped me there. I don't know if I can come up with my top three. Um, <laughs> you know, the from an Austrian perspective, the book is just a series of fallacies and misconceptions and things taken out of context. As a matter of fact, uh, Henry Hazlitt, the great Henry Hazlitt, who wrote Economics in One Lesson, also uh, wrote a book called The Failure of the New New Economics, in which he goes through and shows that there are errors on every single page of that entire book, which is the... um, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money by John Maynard Keynes. We all call it the general theory. Um, Let me see. Top three. Well, it doesn't have to be top three, but you're you're just the the major fallacy of the general theory. Okay. One of the things that I think is a dominant issue with the general theory is that it's very much a demand side book, that it's all premised on the basis of demand being a problem and that uh, recessions are a failure uh, of demand, that somehow demand falls back mysteriously uh, in the economy, which ends up 
causing problems such as unemployment and lower prices and so forth. And the supply side is more or less completely ignored. Now, from an Austrian perspective, we look out there at consumers and we see people who have no problem spending money. That uh, consumers, you know, they, they love to spend money. Um, and, of course, American consumers are, in, in the, over the last 100 years, have become over-consumers and under-savers. And so we don't ever really see a problem with consumers somehow lackadaisically or psychologically uh, having a failure of demand. We're much more concerned with the supply side, uh, entrepreneurs, investors, uh, that sort of thing. And ultimately we see that uh, that's the important sector to be concerned about because if the supply side is working uh, and consumers are earning plenty of money from their jobs, uh, then the economy should roll along uh, in a state of economic progress and stability. So what's wrong uh, with the supply side? Well, there's a cup, There's two important things. One is, is that the supply side has to have enough savings, real savings by people foregoing consumption uh, to make an economy uh, prosperous and growing. So as you and I put money in our bank accounts and banks are able to make loans to businesses and entrepreneurs or to expand the amount of money that is being lent to or made available to entrepreneurs and businesses, that means they can expand production. That means they can expand um, their payroll. And you know, so every company has a payroll where they have to pay their workers before their products are actually sold. So you, all these businesses more or less have to have access to this savings uh, in order to maintain their payroll and, and their their other inputs into the production process. So whereas the Keynesians view savings as a leakage from the system, detracting from consumption, uh, we see it as the primary input into the whole supply side, the whole payroll side uh, of the economy. So Keynesians attack savings, Austrians we think it's crucial. Um, and then, of course, the other problem on the supply side is the business cycle, which is more or less a whole uh, separate uh, issue. But um, Keynes and the Keynesians view the business cycle as the result of psychological factors. Uh, they somehow believe that in boom time, in the economy that people are psychologically happy, enthusiastic, and willing to take on risk. And they view uh, recessions and depressions as is, is a time when everybody somehow uh, has negative psychological feelings, uh, they're afraid, they're not willing to take on risks, uh, and those sorts of things. So for Keynes, the business cycle is driven by animal spirits or psychological factors. Now, Austrians, on the other hand, we recognize that there are these psychological changes in the economy, but we want to know what the economic cause of these psychological changes, what, what is causing this mass happiness and this mass uh, depression uh, in the economy, and what we have established and illustrated vividly through history is that it's the central bank's mistake in setting interest rates too low that cause entrepreneurs to go out and become too enthusiastic, too opportunistic, and too speculative about the economy. And so they engage in large investment projects um, that are seemingly justified by these low interest rates. Uh, but ultimately, if it's just the interest rate driving it, then many of these investment projects are going to ultimately be found to be bad investments. And so in the boom phase, 
everybody's making money, everybody's got a job, every entrepreneur is making profits, more profits than they even anticipated, and so naturally they become psychologically happy. And then once we get further along into the cycle and the expected costs of production are rising and the expected prices that they had hoped to sell these things uh, for start falling and the profit picture going forward uh, gets bleaker and bleaker until profits turn to losses, that's when everybody becomes depressed because they've been so successful for so long and now all of their projects, all of their plans are looking uh, like they're going to end up being bankrupt. And so everybody does turn psychologically depressed, but there's a real tangible economic reason for that, and Austrians are the only ones who really see that. The funny thing about the journal theory is that there's no empirical evidence that the journal theory actually worked when it came around back in the time. And yet the government uh, drank its Kool-Aid mainly because it was his policy and his theories were government friendly. It, it allowed um, the government to grow and, and get more control over the economy, which I, I can see why they decided to adopt this concept over free market economic or even Austrian economic. Yeah, that's right, Mo. Um, there was no empirical content really to the general theory itself. Now, in the aftermath of the general theory, there was more and more of this empirical work. Initially, it seemed to suggest that the Keynesians were right and that John Maynard Keynes was right, and the results were uh, glorious in some sense. But as we started looking at these empirical investigations, we had to start making adjustments to make them try to fit the real world. For example, people who studied the multiplier where if the government spends a dollar, um, you know, initially they thought it would increase GDP by 8 to $10. Um, but they forgot to uh, do things like, well, where did that dollar come from? Well, if we took a dollar away from someplace else, then you had sort of a reverse multiplier process over in that part of the economy. So as the analysis of the multiplier became refined over time, what we found is that the value of that multiplier, the ability of the government to spend and generate economic growth, shrank over time. And the last study that I saw um, by a mainstream economist, I think at the Federal Reserve, uh, found that the value of the multiplier was less than one in many cases. So that if the government took money from one place in the economy and invested it someplace else, you actually ended up reducing uh, GDP. So uh, the, the empirical evidence that's developed in the 1970s to the present has shown Keynesian economics to be uh, really on net uh, harmful to the economy rather than beneficial to the economy. And we're living through that experience right now where the government is taking massive amounts of money uh, from the economy and from loan markets out of savings and spending it on wars and spies and you know so on and so forth. Um, and the economy is still in a quagmire. So no matter what number of stimulus that Paul Krugman can come up with, it's still not going to work. You can't just spend your way out of an economy. Uh, you can't borrow your way out of, an, out of a bad economy. Uh, it's the spending and the borrowing that got the economy in trouble in the first place. So... You know, when it comes to your 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 question, which is why mainstream economics was adopted by governments and politicians, and not they didn't adopt Austrian or free market economics, it's pretty straightforward actually. The politicians and government um, inherently like to spend money, um, 
they love to borrow money, especially because they don't have to tax people today uh, to make that spending. And so in Washington, D.C., the budget process is now entirely derailed, um, and the recent agreement says that they're going to be able to spend you know, all the money they want uh, in future years, and uh, there's no constraint on spending. So politicians love to spend money. Uh, they love to f- feel like they are curing uh, the economy, that they're creating jobs uh, in the economy, uh, and their friends that give them money to run their campaigns are usually the beneficiaries of that spending. So the special interest groups love this as well because they end up enriching themselves over, you know, or off of the typical, um, you know, Joe Sixpack uh, on mainstream in the real economy. So they love it and they don't like Austrian economics. They hate free market economics because our policy recommendations are things that involve pain for the politicians. Uh, things like, for example, if, if, if the budget is unbalanced, then we would recommend uh, cutting spending solely uh, or cutting spending and cutting taxes and cutting regulations in combination. And so the austerity position of Austrians is that politicians, bureaucrats, government workers, and government retirees would see a cut in their paycheck and a cut in their benefit uh, package uh, that's necessary to balance the budget. So it wouldn't reduce services initially. It would just reduce paychecks and benefit programs for government employees And, of course, naturally, at that point, with the proper incentive, um, they wouldn't have the incentive to just spend endlessly and to borrow endlessly um, in the economy. And then, of course, we would recommend uh, cutting taxes and cutting regulations uh, throughout the economy. Well, Mark, this has been a great discussion on talking about Austrian economic versus mainstream economic or John Maynard Keynes economics. Uh, which has been a failure for the past eight years, or recently the 2008 financial crisis. Um, so, if people want to find out more about your work, where can they go? Well, our website is Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. We have a Facebook page. We are very active uh, on Twitter. Um, I'm at Dr. Mark Thornton on Twitter. And uh, we have some great content. We have the largest economic content in in the world, and it's written for everybody to be able to read in contrast to mainstream economics. And so our academic journals, our newsletters, our daily, Mises Daily, um, is all available 24-7, 365. It's for free, and you don't have to register. You can sign up to get... Um, for example, the Mises Daily in your um, inbox every day, which is a great read. It's usually only about a thousand words, and it's on something very, very current and very, very topical. So, if if you've listened to this show and you think you side with the Austrians, then that's the first thing I would recommend is to go and sign up for the Mises Daily, so you get a daily dose of Austrian economics, uh, something that you're not going to see in, in the mainstream media. Um, or hear about in your college classrooms typically, uh, but you'll get it there and uh, you'll, your knowledge about how the real economy really works will increase over time and you'll also feel better just understanding why we have this quagmire and why we have this economic dysfunction and why we have this currency war and uh, the grip that crony capitalism has over our government. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Mark, and uh, hopefully you can come back on it again soon. Thank you, Mo. Uh, I had a great time, and you asked great questions, and I'd always be happy to come back on your program.